think we can go ahead and get started. We might have some people trickling in and that's fine. Um, if you weren't here just a minute ago, I mentioned that we are recording this. You can uh, always um, contact us separately if, there, if you're not comfortable with that. Um, and you can always ask questions outside of this meeting. So I just pasted an agenda in the chat. Um, I think we have a small enough group that this can be a decently loose agenda because we just want to make sure that you all are getting what you want out of this meeting. But um, I was hoping we could do just really quick intros so that we know who everyone is and um, what business you're with. And then um, Bruno is here and he was part of the original uh, vision for the Melrose Promenade. So it'd be great if you could give some of that yeah. background. We'll walk through to the design, answer questions, then we'll talk about construction and um, get some information from you all on your preferences so that's best to coordinate during construction. Um, is that covering yeah. what people want to cover today? Yeah, I think that that's good. Okay, great. Um, let's do intros. Maybe I'll just kind of um, call on people. I feel like that can be the least awkward way. <laughs> so I'm Sarah Colling. I'm with SDOT. I am the outreach lead uh, for the Melrose Promenade Project. So I'll, I'll be one of the main points of contact during construction and before. Um, Jasmine, if you want to go ahead. Hi, everyone. My name is Jasmine Beverly, and I am the outreach consultant on this project. So I'll be working really closely with Sarah for outreach. Thank you. We can keep going through the list at S. Dot. Um, Marilyn, you there? Uh, Hi, you are on mute. That's right. Sorry. Um, okay, so I'm on here twice. One's my laptop and one's my phone. <laughs> I only get audio through my phone. So uh, I'm Marilyn Yim. I'm the project manager with S. Dot for this project and sticking with it all the way through design and construction. Um, and so I'll pop off of the video so that I can put my phone down. <laughs> okay, great, thanks. Lai, you wanna go next? Yes, I am Lai Pham. I will be the construction engineer for the project. Thank you. Um, Michael. Yeah, hi everybody. Um, I uh, was formerly with the Office of Economic Development as a small business advocate. I just joined the mayor's office as business liaison. Um, so I'm still talking to OED quite a bit. I know AJ Carr will be joining the call a little later. He couldn't make it right at the top, but um, I'm here to hear the conversation, get your feedback um, and help Marilyn and Sarah with the conversation with stakeholders. So happy to be here, happy to see you all. I was involved in the very, very early conversations around the Melrose Promenade back when Mike Kent started the whole project, but only tangentially, um, but happy to be here, happy to talk more. Great, thank you. Um, and Forrest, if you want to introduce yourself. Oh, you're on mute. Yeah, I have a retail shop on Melrose right in between the market and Taylor Shellfish. Great. Okay, and Russ? Hey guys, uh, my name's Russ. I own Range Shadow Meats inside the Melrose market. Um, yeah, I'm just looking forward to being really involved in this whole project, so. Great. Okay, um, Jerry, I know that you were on mute because it's noisy around you, so if you'd like to introduce yourself, great. I, uh, yeah, I found a quieter spot here. Uh, Jerry Everard, and I am uh, with the building that has uh, six arms and stateside. Great. Okay, Julie. Julie, you're on mute right now. Okay, our, our, this is Julie Bame and my husband Greg Bame and we have 1516 Melrose, the Black House on the Hill. Um, Good afternoon, this is Greg Baim. It's hard for me to talk. I just got out of the dentist, so I'm totally numbed up. So I'm gonna listen more than talk at this point. Okay. <laughs> okay. 
Understand. So uh, anyway, I hope hopefully everybody knows when we say the black house, it's kind of like in the middle of the block. That's us. Perfect. I'm glad yeah. you're here. And Jen. You look like you're off mute, Jen, but we can't hear you. Earlier, you did say you're with Green Fire, and it, it looks like you also changed your title there, so that's helpful. Okay, so I'm Jen. I have the tiny loft space above homegrown sandwiches just inside the Melrose Market Hall, and it is a retail and event venue space. Great, thank you. Uh, Lorenzia, so you joined us. If you could do a quick intro. Yes, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Lorenzio Dustchuk. I am um, with SDOT and I'm the uh, project engineer for this project. Perfect. Yes. Is there anyone that we missed? Um, we'll lead into Bruno, your piece after this. Okay. okay. Yeah, Bruno, if you want to go ahead and share some of the history of the Melrose Promenade. So, uh, yeah, I mean, the first thing is I want to be very clear that, um, you know, I'm standing on the shoulders of giants. Uh, Mike Ken and, and Mel uh, Burchett basically were the driving force that started this project in 2010. And uh, a lot of the legwork, especially for the, the entire Melrose Avenue, because this project covers, you know, as, as hopefully everybody knows, you know, from Pike Street to Roy. And so it, it covers a lot of different sections of the street with diff very different requirements. Being uh, really, uh, I'm the, the owner of the building that uh, Mamnoon is in. Uh, so I was primarily invested and interested in what happened between Pike and Pine. Although I do, uh, I'm also uh, on the steering committee for Lead I-5. And therefore, I'm also, as part of that, I was also interested in what would happen on uh, sections of Melrose that are further north. So, um, you know, the key things that happened is that, so Mike basically did start the project, I think in about uh, 2010, and started getting the community engaged in redesigning the entire street and improving the conditions on the entire street. And then he uh, applied for a bunch of, of grants and uh, got other people involved to come up with uh, designs and get the community involved and, and, and feedback and get their feedback. In uh, 2017, uh, with Liz Dunn, who at the time was one of the uh, uh, owners of the Melrose Market, we also organized a, a big uh, community forum to review and talk about specifically the section of Melrose between Pike and Pine. And because it is definitely uh, a completely different um uh, situation, I would say, than the rest of Melrose, as far as the number of businesses, the traffic, the and and uh, the the number of visitors that we're getting. So that's a quick summary. Uh, they are, if people are interested, I can, uh, you know, there, you can go to melrosepromenade.com. The website is still available if you want to learn more about what was discussed. I think a lot of the people on this call were. Uh, participated in the in the original uh, discussion, so I don't think that there is a lot for them uh, to to learn. I think the interesting uh, piece will be to see how you know S dot will implement some of that vision. Great, yeah, and thank you for being here and um, sharing some of that history. And yes, so. The Melrose Promenade Vision from Neighbors is a very um, exciting and um, grand vision to make Melrose Avenue um, a promenade, <laughs> to make it very inviting for uh, people walking and biking. And so this project um, 
we got a federal grant for. And so this is kind of one of the first um, very foundational steps in um, achieving that vision. And so this project is um, primarily focused on safety, um, uh, walking and biking safety in particular, because we do have a history of collisions, particularly in the blocks north of um, the Pike Pine block. And, um, but it also does have some really nice pedestrian improvements on the Pike to Pine block. Um, so unless, feel free to jump in with questions, otherwise I'll keep moving to give an overview of what those improvements will be. I am going to share my screen. Okay, so on our project webpage is a link to this poster. Um, hope maybe you're seeing this poster out. Um, in the area outside. Sarah, so we can't quite see your screen yet. I was about to actually click share. That might help. Okay. Can you see it now? Yes. yes. Great. Thanks, Jasmine. <laughs> um, so if you see this, this image on the right, this is a high level overview of what the improvements will be. So you can see um, on Pine, just north of of your block um, will have new curb ramps on each corner with bike crossings. Um, we're keeping that artistic crosswalk that's already there on the north side and we're gonna raise it up. So we'll make that, co that crosswalk concrete and it'll be raised. So it'll be kind of a natural speed hop for drivers. Um, so Sarah, just to be clear, so that means you're gonna raise it and then the artist is gonna repaint it? As, as it is now? Yeah, we, we okay. have that design, so we'll be able to reinstall the same design. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, working our way south, we, right now, as you know, this sidewalk is, is pretty narrow for the use. You know, there's a, there's a lot of people walking right here, and there's um, some tables set up outside. Um, and so we're gonna be expanding the sidewalk right here, you can see this is an expansion. The reason we're not expanding up here is we have some kind of significant utility vaults that um, our utility agencies need to get into. But but here, we're, it, this is a pretty decent expansion. And then this is a full fold of the sidewalk and it'll be bulbed out all the way to 18 feet here. So this will be 18 feet wide. Um, and we'll include a couple of things like um, a bike rack and trees. And then coming down here, um, we, that does mean removing some of the parking that's there. We will be including these load zones. We know loading's important. Um, we'll be also raising this whole intersection, this minor, Pike Melrose intersection. Um, so this will be concrete that's scored at the top. So it has kind of a neat design and it's raised up. Um, so that will definitely make people walking feel like they're kind of on a pedestal, like this is their space. Um, and drivers with this kind of design um, are prompted to act accordingly. <laughs> so they, they really slow down. Um, similar to the north side of the block, we'll also have that artistic crosswalk on top of the raised intersection. Um, Lorenzo, anything I'm missing or any questions from the group? Can you explain where the curb ball will go? Is it uh, right in front of, of uh, Taylor and... Uh, and, and glass wing, or is it further? How, what are the businesses that are right in front of it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is pretty much right in front of that main market entrance. Okay. Lorenzo, I don't know if you yeah. happen to have the length dimensions of that. I know it's 18 feet wide, but it could help to know how long it is. If you're able to pull it up at any point. Um, I think it's about 60 foot long, if I remember, but I'll, I'll check on the number. Okay. 
But yeah, I think I think this drawing is is about to scale. So it's it's roughly uh, that size, um, just about mid block. Um, and and yeah, it does it does uh, it's in, in front of the main entrance to the market. And I think it, it actually uh, stretches from uh, there's two other entrances to the south and north, and it stretches almost um, across the three entrances there. I can't remember what the business names are or the entrances, but yeah, it almost covers three entrances. Okay. Hey, Sarah, this is Greg Bain. Mm -hmm. My question is, um, is the, uh, is it, is there a two way lane or is it a one way going north? It'll still be two way for drivers. But then, but you're talking about parking is going to be limited, obviously at this point in time, but two cars, will be able to go by. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. it, it would, the, the, the travel lanes will be just a little bit narrower, so eight, 18 feet in total uh, for travel lanes. Uh, so and that, any, that, that's in line with, with uh, kind of our standards for, for this type of uh, street. And so with the speed bumps and, the, and what have you, and the parking, what have you, probably people will be going slower than they have in the past. Yeah, that's the idea. So it will encourage lower speeds. Okay. Um, and there's not gonna be a, a center stripe down the middle. So what you see in the drawing is, um, it's kind of a, a bike symbol with two arrows. Yes, um, yes and I that's, saw that. Yeah, that's to kind of identify that this is a bike route, but it is two, uh, two lanes of travel. Got it, thanks. One of the key question I, I, I don't want to, if somebody else has. Or go Jasmine, ahead, Bruno. You, I was just going to jump in with a couple of comments from the chat, but you go first. Um, well, one, one question I had was um, about the, the, uh, the, power, uh, the, the, the power lines that, you know, uh, were moved to the, to the west sidewalk uh, when the, the the Excelsior building was under construction. Actually, last week we got our, uh, they cut the power on the on the street, and I was hoping that the work was uh, was going to be related to moving them back, or as I understand, it was supposed to uh, put those power lines under uh, underground. Uh, that did not happen, and actually this morning there were some Cedarlite uh, people working on the other side of Pike, and. Um, I talked to the to the engineer there, and they said that yeah, what with the work that they're doing has nothing to do with either moving the poles back to the to to the east sidewalk or to underground the uh, the power line. And I don't know if you guys have, at SDOT have had a chance to uh, contact City Light. Uh, basically, that engineer was engineer was telling me that yeah, it always falls through the cracks, and there is no clear way to you know really uh, resurrect that that project unless you know who to talk to. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, I, response. yeah, and so I mean, I think this is a concern because we're going to end up with wider sidewalks on on the uh, on the east side with basically those poles being right smack in the middle of that wider sidewalk. And so I, I think that that's really something that should be, that should be resolved uh, before the work starts, because uh, you would hope that we could, we could actually resolve that once and for all and not have to wait another 10 years to do, for them to do it. Yeah, Marilyn, do you have any more to share on that? So this is Greg again, uh, just to kind of support Bruno because Bruno and I are right next door to one another. I had an independent conversation with uh, Seattle City Light during that same time frame, and because it kind of re really brought up a red flag and Bruno and I had not talked at that point in time, but that was supposed to be temporary. That's, and I said, well, what's temporary? They can go, you know, as soon as the project is completed, it will go back to where it was originally. And so knowing that that was 11 years ago <laughs> and nothing's been done. Uh, yeah. Somewhere in that range there. Mm -hmm. We've been at our place since 97. And, uh, and Bruno was, I want to say, right around 09, 10, somewhere in that range there. But both of us 
were informed that was temporary. Okay. So I was just, this is Marilyn. I'll go ahead and get on camera too while I'm talking. Um, maybe you can see me, I don't know. Well, no, it's okay, Sarah's sharing Sarah, screen. It's okay. Um, so I was just gonna say that we have reached out to City Light and so we're trying to get into this and research it um, and find out what the answer is from them on this issue. But yeah, we've continued to hear it brought up from you guys and from the Melrose Market owners and so forth. So um, we are seeking an answer from them on what that is. I did go back and look at um, Google Street View just to kind of get a timeline, you know, and um, it looks like the pole was probably moved, you know, the lines were probably moved from the east side to the west side of the street. I would say around, you know, 2014 is when it's shown there. Um, 2011, it wasn't there. And then it looks like construction on the property at the um, southeast corner of Melrose and Pine was um, started around that time, like 2015 to 2016. So that's about when it looks like the construction was probably completed, 2016-ish. So it's been at least five years since then. Right. And um, we'll let you know what we find out. It looks like there's uh, two utility poles, I think, where the power lines are currently like jogged over to the other side of the street. Um, so yeah, we'll keep you posted on what we find out. But we, we let them know that, you know, you'd like to reclaim the sidewalk space back for actually walking on. Right. Mm -hmm. the, the, the other question, and, and it's, it is unfortunate that uh, the sidewalks by Machiavelli is not going to be, uh, it cannot be widened because they have all their uh, trash containers on the sidewalk there. And that's really not a pleasant walking experience. Um, so one of the one of the question that was raised, uh, you know, by the community is that could there be a centralized uh, trash container that all the properties and at least all the restaurants on the street could, uh, could use, so that we don't end up with so many different you know trash bags and containers on the sidewalk? Is that uh, is that something that uh, you, you've been able to look into? Is yeah, that we, for me or for Sarah? Yeah, I think um, both I of us maybe. We've met with Seattle Public Utilities, but Marilyn, if you want to. Um, yeah, we yeah we we talked with the gal at Seattle Public Utilities who specifically works together with. Um, commercial, I believe it's mainly commercial customers for the kind of, you know, large scale bins and everything. So she went out and did a site walk with us and the um, owners of the Melrose Market, which was the main one that we were discussing that with. Um, um, I didn't hear any follow up after that, you know, because I think she was going to kind of take that on, but we can go and check back in there and see, you know, what they may have um, determined from that. Okay. okay. Yeah. That, that... That'd be great because the, I mean, I do think that it, it, it is impacting uh, the, the feel and, of the street and, and, and definitely uh, once we widen the sidewalk, I think a lot of people are going to be walking on that side and having to walk by and having the smell and, mm -hmm. and even the, the appearance of all that trash is really not that, that pleasant. Yeah, I think the preference of SPU is for that stuff to mainly be contained within the property as much as possible and to not have it spilling out into the public right of way. And they have different options for how they handle, you know, this is a very constrained situation. And, and a lot of the um, businesses have kind of fairly high needs for, you know, food waste and stuff like that to be picked up on a very regular basis. So um, that's not my program, but they, they do have, you know, uh, the preferences for how that stuff is handled and managed. But yeah, we can go and, and loop back to see, can kind of get an update on that one. I think that's Sally, Sally Hunsman over at SPU. She yes, does mostly yes. commercial waste. Mm -hmm. Probably a lot of you folks have dealt with Sally around waste issues, perhaps um, at that corner, but uh, we can certainly follow up again. Hey, I have one question. I apologize. I'm not really supposed to be asking questions as a staff member, but Sarah, <laughs> um, can I ask... Uh, I, I just want to make sure that I understand the speed bump and the slow, um, the messaging. Are there are there signs or the speed bumps themselves? I'm not a driver, as many people in the city know. So I'm just wondering how indicative it is that people know the slow. I know there's the elevated sidewalk, but is it 
the speed bumps themselves will provide that message or will there be any signage around that? If, if you wouldn't mind explaining that, I'd appreciate it. Yeah, so we'll have, um, I, I was kind of saying that that raised crosswalk on the north side will act like a speed hump. It's not technically a speed hump, but just just because it's raised, um, that's a signal to drivers to slow down. Um, we have a few examples of them of those in the city. One I can think of is on MLK um, in the central district. We have and we have a few others. Okay. Does that help? It does. I'm just thinking. It seems to me, and the Melrose folks can tell me if I'm wrong about this, that sometimes people use the street as a pass through, and um, so I don't know about that. I see. Okay, so that won't be the only thing slowing people down. Um, also, just narrowing the street uh, and narrowing the lanes will be okay. a very natural way of slowing people down. Um, yeah. And then having that raised intersection yeah. will um, just make pedestrians the more intuitive priority. Okay. okay, that helps a lot. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Michael, I don't know if you, I mean, w when we had the community discussion about this, the, the key issue, as you know, or maybe uh, uh, you might not remember, is that uh, a lot of people are using Melrose as uh, access to the the on ramp of uh, right. I five north, yeah. right. and so these are people coming mostly from downtown, trying mm -hmm. to get to to I five north, and they tend to speed right. quite a bit on that street. So one of the things that we we did, um, or SDOT did, I didn't do anything, is to uh, make the left turn from Pike onto Melrose illegal. The problem is the signage is very confusing. And mm -hmm. when I look at it, I, I nobody respects it. Mm -hmm. I guess I'm the only one who does it. I make mm -hmm. the effort of, <laughs> of uh, when I'm coming from downtown, not turning on uh, left uh, on Melrose, but uh, almost nobody else does. So Right, yeah. yeah. And that's why I asked the question, Bruno, because I know that that's an issue for the um, for the street. And I just wanted to be clear in my head about that. And I know there are things at SDOT that you do that are, sort of naturally create um, patterns uh, for drivers. I just, uh, uh, I don't engage with cars that way. So I just wanted to double check. So, but thank you, Bruno. That's That was what I was asking about the, those issues. Yeah. And, and it does lead to a question for for Sarah, I guess, uh, is that are you planning on changing that, that sign? Uh, because it, it makes it, I mean, the number of time that I've seen uh, near collision, especially with bikes going down uh, pike. So people that are turning left there have to look at cars coming, at bikes uh, coming, and at pedestrians crossing Melrose. So it's it's really tricky, and uh, and and I do think that uh, better enforcement, better signage, and better enforcement of it could definitely help. Yeah, this is something we'll share with our traffic operations team um, because maybe they could do an observation and see what solutions they have. Okay. Okay, and Jasmine, thanks for drawing my attention to the chat. It looks like um, Forrest has a couple questions. Mm -hmm. um, first, the, does the curb bulb include trees, benches, bike parking? Um, and yeah, the curb bulb that is adjacent to the Melrose Market, um, we are planning to put in trees and bike parking. I don't think we have plan for, plans for benches. Um, Lorenzo, if you want to fill in any other detail on that. Yeah, no, that's correct. Um, there's no benches planned. Um, and yeah, there's a few trees in the large bulb and a, a few more um, along the entire block because the with the wider sidewalk, um, it's it allows street trees. So the the entire block will have 12 foot uh, width in sidewalk. So that's our standard for um, to, to place street trees in there. Great. Do you know what kind of trees? Um, if not, that's something we can send over later. Yeah, I can check in the, in the plans. Uh, Okay. But yeah, urban forestry recommended some trees for us to use. 
Okay. Fourth, it looks like your next question was about trash, and I think we covered that, but feel free to follow up if we didn't. Um, your last one was, we currently have so many signs bolted into our sidewalk. Is it possible to eliminate some of those so that people can use that wider sidewalk? Um, and Lorenzo, do you know, will we be consolidating any of that signage? I think if they're not needed, um, they would be removed. But from what I know, um, we're, we're maintaining about the same type of operations on the street. So I think mostly the signs will get relocated, but um, there will be more, more space on the sidewalk and it would be more of a dedicated furniture zone, um, you know, with benches, with not benches, trees and bike racks. So I think the signs are, are not gonna feel like they're in the way as much. Mm -hmm. There would definitely be more space to maneuver. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, I think we can move on to talk about construction. Can, um, I, can I ask one, one more question? So, sure. I'm sorry, I've, I've, <laughs> you know, I don't want to no, go ahead. Uh, derail the, the meeting, but uh, are there any plans for changing the lighting on the street? And if, and if not, do you know how we should push for that? Is there a different uh, city agency that we should talk to? I mean, right now, the, the, the lighting is really horrible and it makes the, the, the street you know, unpleasant at night. And I think the, the vision, uh, the Melrose Promenade vision was calling for better lighting. That's another one I'll lean on you for, Lorenzo. So, yeah, SCL uh, manages the the lighting in the city. Yeah, Seattle City uh, Light. Seattle City Light. Um, and um, yeah, I'm not sure what the what the standards are for for this type of um, street. What what type of street lighting is appropriate? But yeah, I think um, SC we would have to check in with SCL standards on, on that. So I'm curious uh, to kind of hear, this is Marilyn, by the way, I'm curious to hear a little bit about uh, some background there. Is it that you're saying that it's too dark, it's not bright enough, or uh, am I getting that right? Yeah. I think I think that the, yeah, it, the where there are lights, it's that horrible, you know, um, color and, and, it's it's really the kind of lighting that you see on roads where you know that where they really try to get the best lighting possible for driving conditions, but for a mostly pedestrian or for a pedestrian focused uh, street, I think that it's not appropriate. Uh, when you look at the Pike Pine um, corridor and the improvements that they're doing there, they're switching to you know, lighting that's, they, they're putting more lights and they lower and a lot more pleasant for, for pedestrians. So that would, that to me would be a, a major improvement to the, to the street. Okay. okay. So yeah, that that's, sounds like that's pedestrian scale lighting. Um, so in addition to the street lighting, right, you would like to see pedestrian lighting. Um, but yeah, I think that was that was not um, within our budget for this project, so we, it's not included with this with this project. Um, but yeah. Thank okay, you. but if you could if you could reach out to City Light or put us in touch with the right people in, in City Light, I would I would like to pursue that uh, and try to get some improvement. Okay. Um, let's move to talking about construction. So um, just as a quick overview, the, the heaviest construction that we anticipate on this block will be building this raised intersection because it, it means digging up the whole intersection, putting in forms, pouring the concrete and doing the scoring. Um, and then build widening the sidewalk. Um, we do, plan to have a requirement that the construction contractors keep the sidewalk open um, and maintain that business access. Um, so 
Um, that's at least a minimum. But we did want to talk to you all about some specifics on how we can do this to make it as, I can't say as painless as possible because painless will be impossible, <laughs> but um, to minimize impacts as much as we can. Um, and so a couple of questions we had, um, but we also want to hear your um, additional input, but is on preference for shorter, more intense um, construction and versus longer, less intense. And so shorter, more intense could mean um, closing this a whole intersection um, for a couple weekends or a couple weeks. Um, it depends on the, the contractor on those specifics um, to do this raised intersection all at once. Otherwise, if they're um, longer, less intense would be letting cars drive through when they do the intersection half at a time. Um, and that will just take quite a bit longer. Um, and then the other questions we have are around um, when uh, is busiest for you all. And I think we can probably anticipate that summer is busiest um, for a lot of your businesses. And that's always tricky because that's what, that's the best time for us to pour concrete because <laughs> it's the driest and the warmest. Um, so we're gonna, uh, like Marilyn says, we're gonna try and thread the needle <laughs> to figure out how, to, how we can minimize impacts. Um, Marilyn or Lai, anything else you wanna share on that? Yeah, I'm glad that you mentioned, you know, this is, we have two sites on the whole corridor that I think are probably the most intense construction activities. And so, yeah, this intersection is one, the other one will be up at the Olive Way on-ramp where we're going to be reconfiguring the on-ramp. So those are like the two, you know, really heaviest construction. And so I don't want to, you know, mislead anybody about this being like an easy couple of weekends kind of thing. Um, I think, Lai, you might be a little bit better versed at estimating, you know, how much cons construction time this would take, but I think we're talking like at least two months, right? Yes, that's uh, uh, if no we allow, yeah, if we allow yeah. the contract to close on a weekend, couple of weekend, the, the contractor can uh, do a half a roadway during, during the week, uh, on a weekday, but in a weekend, they can close for maybe two or three weekends, they can finish it. So we're talking about weekday, half roadway, weekend, uh, we will close the whole uh, intersection so the concrete can they can pour the concrete. So, ba so basically, uh, in the summertime is the best time to do construction. But sometimes we don't want it too hot. You know, because you know the car, the go back to the, uh, the the concrete, the chemistry of the concrete. You know, if it's too hot, the it will crack in. So we want like maybe June, July is the best time. You go to August, maybe too hot, and we don't want to deal with the heat too. Sometimes you say good weather. We don't want too hot, but we want no water. Just that that is the key, you know, like June and July is the best way to do it. The best the best time to do it. Right. And we also need dry weather. That's really important too. So um, you know, we, we can sometimes pour concrete later in the year when it's wet, but not too wet, right? You have yes. actually have to use a different concrete mix if you're gonna be accepting worse weather. So, you know, there's things like that we, that we try to balance out, but I think from what Lai said, you know, you, you can kind of imagine this is going to be a lot of work, um, a lot of, yeah, a lot of construction activity at that one location for sure. Um, and it's out of a total construction schedule or duration about seven months. So from beginning to end seven months and at least two months of it is at this, this one location. So, I, so I, location, do you mean on the whole block between Pike and Pine? I mean that intersection. That one intersection. Okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, the raised intersection because it's just a it's a lot of work. You know, we're rebuilding that whole intersection really, the pavement. Um, and right now, time frame we're thinking this will start as early as June. Uh, so seven months takes us through January, February next year. So that's 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 what it's looking like at the moment. Um, and then as far as construction methods, you know, we. Uh, generally we give guidelines to the contractor, but the contractor is responsible to propose their method of, of how they're going to do this work. Um, you know, they're incentivized, I think, to, um, to do it in the most efficient way. We, you know, we want them to propose something that's creative that, you know, to be able to get the work done within the, the guidelines and the timeframes that we have. 
Um, but we don't usually, you know, get too prescriptive on it because when we start to, you know, guide and direct and, and restrict what the contractor can do, then um, that that cuts out the options that they may have and it ends up costing the public more. So this is one of these things that we try to balance with public works contracting because we're using taxpayer dollars to do this and we want to be able to get the most um, the best work at the best price for taxpayer dollars. So it's one of those things where we're trying to balance all those, you know, all those needs at the same time. But uh, the neighbors who are going to be right next to it, you know, you're very important. We're going to be seeing a lot of you and you'll see a lot of us. And we want to make sure that this, um, that we're aware of, you know, your operations. Um, you know, if there's, we, we talked to, you know, one of the neighbors about uh, food deliveries and, you know, how, how the uh, garbage trucks approach, those kinds of things we want to be aware of to make sure that, that those things are still accessible and, um, and workable. So if uh, people are feeling a uh, preference either way, or if anything's jumping out to them, feel free to share with the group. You could also type into the chat. I'd like to know if instead of closing on the weekends, could they close it completely like Monday through Wednesday or something like that of the week? Really truly are our busiest times of the week. Um, so when there's disruption all week long already, and then you close it on the weekend, that seems like there's got to be a workaround for that. Um, and also any like holiday weekends, the first thing that pops into my mind is 4th of July. Um, just like have that just blocked out now is like that entire week running up to 4th of July, just like minimize the construction and closures, whether it's access or parking. Um, I guess another question would be like, when when those closures happen, will there still be pedestrian traffic being able to access that? Or is that uh, those I guess, yes, we will uh, require the contractor to uh, have an access pedestrian during construction. So that's the one of the requirement in the specification. Um, so for the closing, sometimes we uh, don't control over the contractor means and method. If you, if you restrict them not to close on a weekend, um, they may not do what we, we ask them for them to do. But you, sometimes you pour the concrete, you, you based on the joint, where you put the joint. So if you don't close on the weekend, so the joint, when you put when you put a panel, so the joint we, we spec on, on the plan may not exactly uh, what we want them to do. So sometimes that's why we put uh, in the spec, we allow for the weekend, maybe a couple of weekend, uh, weekday, we still open the roadway like half. We can still traffic go through it, uh, open half the roadway. Uh, and the weekend, I think that's the best way for uh, method for them to go and pour the, the payment so they can get the whole payment for uh, act and delay us, like uh, the whole in the section. Then you go like, you if you don't pull it the, and the whole thing at the, at the same time, it's kind of uh, 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 not pretty, uh, like, uh, not pretty good for uh, the, uh, uh, for the long-term uh, durability of the intersection. Are you saying that you basically need to close on the weekends to let the concrete cure? Yeah, so we, yeah, we, we, we can cure, you know, we said they need the time to close on a weekend, like if they pull on Saturday, you have to get like the killing time, uh, like a 24 hour. So they, they can, you know, open the next day on Monday. But basically they have to pull on Saturday, close on Sunday. So they open maybe early Monday. Well, couldn't they pour it like Sunday night and then close Monday, Tuesday? I don't know, I just think there's gotta be a workaround to somehow keep those weekends open as much as possible. Yeah, I, no, I think that's really helpful and that makes sense that that would be, they wouldn't be alone in that. Um, and so, yeah, information like that is helpful for us to share with the contractor once we have them on board. Weekends are just, key for us. But just to clarify also, I'm, I'm assuming that you're not talking about doing both intersections, the, the minor pike at the same time as you're doing the, the pine. So the street will always be accessible, right? It has to be accessible even just for the, the Excelsior uh, parking. 
Uh, so we, uh, yeah. Um, that's, um, did, that is something that's helpful to have your preference on. Like if, if you, it could be that we hear um, that neighbors prefer to, to get this done all at once. And if that's possible for the contractor, then it could be possible to close the whole block to drivers. We would have never close it to pedestrians, um, but it could be possible to close it to drivers to speed up the work. But okay. if, if we hear from you that um, no, <laughs> that that wouldn't work for you all, then that's helpful for us to know because we can share that with the contractor. Okay, um, I I mean that's something that you should really uh, check with Excelsior. I mean okay. I'm. I would be in the same boat. I I have a garage in the building, uh, but that's just me and one car. So if I if you know if 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 I have to go park somewhere else for two days, I'm I'm happy for to sacrifice for the good of the of the street. But uh, but the thing that we need to keep in mind also is are the the, the food deliveries the the delivery trucks if they cannot make it to Terra Plata to Taylor Shellfish to to Mamnoon. I mean, for for us, I'm assuming that yeah, they could park on on uh, on Pine, and that's not that far to go. But uh, if you really close the entire street with no access for multiple days, that could be a problem, I think. So in my no, mind, I, I was thinking like we would do the two intersections at different times. Makes the most sense to me too. To do the two intersections at different times. Yeah. Yeah, and Bruno, thank you for bringing that up. And you too, Russ. Those are exactly the kind of specifics that really help the SDOT team try and make decisions that really work, that create the least pain points for you folks. Um, one thing I did want to bring up quickly um, was thinking about uh, the streeteries and outdoor seating arrangements. Um, you know, we don't know exactly what those pieces are going to look like um, come next summer, but I'm assuming that some of what we've done during COVID around streeteries and outdoor dining might continue on. So that's something for you to think about, Bruno. That's something for uh, Jerry, for your folks, Six Arms and uh, uh, Stateside, uh, just to think about next summer, if you're um, anticipating outside dining being vibrant or what you're thinking about that. And we may not know the answers to those things right now, but it's something to, to think about when we're talking to ask out about the project. I just wanted to bring that up. I mean, the, I can tell you that the, the discussion, uh, so to give you a little bit of, of feedback, Michael, we did apply for a street closure permit uh, this year, but it was late in the season. And by the time we got it, the idea was we closed the south side of Melrose. So basically from, uh, from the minor intersection to basically where Taylor uh, uh, Shellfish is. And so that we could put tables on the streets outside. Yeah. And uh, unfortunately, when we got the permit, uh, by the time we got it, uh, we had that, the, the, the massive uh, fire smoke and yeah. then the rain came. So yeah. we only had like three days where we could use it. Yeah. And it's a lot of, it's, it, closing the street is a lot of work. So I think that the, currently the restaurants are more focused on we want to do streeteries for sure. They will need to do streeteries because mm -hmm. they're, they're struggling so much with uh, with revenues right now. And that as soon as the weather gets better, they will want to be on the street. And right. uh, and I think that for Jerry should 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 check with uh, uh, with the six arms and stateside uh, on what they, they they would want to do, and maybe even Starbucks would be interested. Terra Plata is in a better situation because they have the deck. Uh, but Mam Noon definitely wants to do wants to extend their streetery permit to to take on to, uh, I, I think at least one maybe two uh, parking spot next to the current streetery. Okay, that's good to know. Two more questions or one clarification. Did I hear you say, Sarah? I think um, when we when you guys are going to widen the sidewalks, the existing sidewalks that are there are going to stay open the entire time. So you're just adding on to what's already there. Correct. Okay. Yes. And is the street, the entire street, uh, from Pike to Pike, is that getting repaved? No. 
No. Okay. No. So the good news there is that that would be huge, a huge construction impact. <laughs> um, but no, we will generally not be touching the asphalt. Thank um, you. Except to expand the sidewalk. Yeah. One of the things that I noticed for, for us is that, uh, so there's gonna be a loading zone right in front of the market, but uh, Russ, were you also interested in getting a three minute uh, parking spot there for, for customers? Three, yeah, I'm fine with three minute parking spots for customers if we can somehow get the parking enforcement to actually enforce it. That's yeah. So, kind of, that's the issue. Like you can put them there, but if they're not enforced, they don't do any good. People will park there all day. Is it possible to put the map back up of the street? Sure. Um, I have. This is Julie. I have a question. So, um, Bruno said that the Memoons is trying to take on a couple parking spots on the street, and um, I'm looking at kind of where they're located, where the so, and then there's a load zone there. So is the load zone in front of, that's like right, right in front of Mamoons? Where right now I think is their garbage garbage access, right? Or am I on the wrong side? Um, so that zone, yeah, that zone, I think is already a garbage zone. Right, right. Well, right. I might be able to speak to this. Mamoons, yes. I think Readery is right south of, South or north of that, sorry. And we will be maintaining that streetery. Um, Lorenzo, I don't know if you have the um, specifics on the locations. Is the streetery just north of that load zone? Um, the the streetery is south of the load zone. South of it. So, yeah, I think. Um, there's currently a load zone to the south of the, the streetery that will get relocated to the north. So yeah, the, the load zone would basically move um, north of the existing uh, streetery there. And then where's Mamoon's extra, but if they're requesting extra streetery spots, uh, that's a that's a good question. I actually don't know. I thought because that, uh, it's going to be a tight. See right where the that's where the curb bulbs out. All right, right. So I would assume they're going to have to request them to the south because our it's going to be really tight right there. All right. So isn't that the garage into Bruno's place? Where is that listed at this point in time? Or it says low zones. Is that going into his garage? No, because I think this little team house has got to be. I don't know. I think the buildings on there are not to scale. Right. I think that the buildings are off. Yeah, I think so too. It looks like the buildings are, because if you go down to the corner of Pine, that, if I'm looking at this right, because we can't see Pine right now, if you make it a little smaller. They, um, okay, that building on the corner is the old building, I think. So that building takes up two buildings, and then the next one down to be the um, housing authority building and then then it would be I think our building and then it would be right where you have the load zone I think is um, Bruno's exit from his house okay and this is an illustration we can send over um, a cut out of the specific detailed plan set okay I'm going to make sure we're hearing from from everyone. Is there anyone that hasn't been able to chime in yet that would like to share? I have a kind of, a, I guess, a little bit of a clarifying question. Going back a couple of topics to the uh, idea of closures on the weekend versus closures on the weekday. Um, so we mainly just heard from one neighbor, but I just wondered if that's, if your silence is agreement or, <laughs> or if, does everyone think, yeah, weekday is really the better time and, you know, weekend you'd prefer not to have construction activity or I wanted to get a feel for that. 
or does or maybe y'all are just kind of indifferent whatever i don't know <laughs> the only people i see on here are forest and jenna greenfire i don't see any other um, of the business owners in the market or on melrose yeah that's the unfortunate thing i, th I think none of the restaurant owners are here uh okay. i could give you one thing that i would like to propose is that you know the number one rule I think in my mind is that uh, the business owners on the street should be the, a higher priority than the traffic, the car traffic on the street. So, because if the, if the cars have to go around to Bellevue or, or anywhere to get to I-5, I think that that's perfectly fine, uh, hopefully for, for most people on this call. Uh, and then, yeah, the, unfortunately, the restaurants, I know that right now, I don't know how it's going to be in the summer, but right now, for example, Mad Noon is not open on Sunday and they're not open on Monday. Hopefully, when, when, when the pandemic gets under control, that will probably change. I know Terra Plata is open every day. I think uh, Six Arms is open every day. Um, so so th there's going to be... Uh, yeah, I, I, I think that we we should prioritize uh, business activity on the weekend and try to focus uh, construction work, even if that means blocking the car traffic on, you know, two days a week. And ideally, that would be one of the days would be Monday, because at least some of the restaurants are, clo are closed on Monday. Does that make sense? Yeah, for sure. Thank you. Yeah, that's helpful. Um, I think what I, we, um, how can I say this? I'm not too worried about people trying to cut through. I'd rather they didn't when we're in construction. Um, <laughs> so that's not my, my worry at all. But, you know, you're, you're kind of right that I think a lot of our approach to, you know, weekday and weekend closures is fairly based on, you know, before COVID, um, what we would expect in traffic patterns, right? You know, and so especially when you're in a place like, you um, central business district, you can expect that there's going to be a heavy um, weekday peak in the morning and the afternoon, right, for commuting. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think a lot of our approach to work is usually sort of based on that kind of, you know, assumption about traffic patterns. Um, so if, and that's why weekend, we would say, well, if we had to do, do a full closure, we'll usually do it on the weekend, right? So if, and potentially even a three-day weekend. If we did a five-day weekday closure, I wonder if that's, I mean, I think that we'll have a discussion, you know, together at the office, right, online. Um, but I think we'll have a discussion about, you know, whether maybe that might be something that we sort of like, if that's like, more acceptable to the neighbors, potentially we can, I don't know if we can do some horse trading with our contractor to just say, hey, we'll give you week weekends, but, you know, we could do weekdays. And, you know what I mean? I, I wonder if that might be something that we, if it's acceptable to the neighbors, potentially could put on the table. Yeah, it's sounding like, um, based on the chat also, the weekdays are perfect. Um, I am also getting a general sense that um, closing that intersection um, would be okay as, as long as it means speeding up construction overall. Okay. But feel free to correct me if, I'm, if I didn't interpret that right. It did sound like you had a good note that we need to check with Excelsior on um, closing the whole block and generally closing the whole block wouldn't be preferred. It sounds like yes to closing the whole intersection, that one intersection, but the whole block would be a bigger impact and not preferred. I would agree. Um, the, the idea is like, in build, like for example, closing things off the first part of the week. Uh, it seems like the restaurants and some of the stores are um, kind of take a little bit of time off. So it's like when the contractors are able to work on that Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, or, or, or basically just, you know, closing things off for several days. I agree with what Bruno was saying earlier. Let's try to keep things, you know, open on these weekends. And I'm going to say Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. I'm not in retail, but I would think those are prime times. So yeah. if the contractors can really you know, get things done quicker, you know, that would be that I think closing off things in the first part of the week would, would make sense for everybody. Mm -hmm. 
I think I saw a nod from you, Russ, on that. You agree with that, that Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday are the best times? Yes, 100%. And I, I want to second what Bruno said about not giving the commuters preference over the business owners. And I, I see Diane Peterson on here, which I'm happy to see her name on there because we've had conversations over over Christmas time about the closures that happened Christmas week. And it, the, it seems like the contractors get a lot more preference than the business owners. The business owners are always the last people to know. And it's always at the construction people, the construction company's convenience. And it's always very inconvenient for us. So I'd like, I'd like to second kind of what Bruno said, that yes, we shouldn't you know, base these things around commuter traffic, but it needs to be based and not based off of the contractors, like best time for the contractors to do it. Definitely a balance. And yeah, thanks Diane for being here. And Diane has been really good at bridging the, um, the work that the private development is doing um, with our work to make sure it's all coordinated. And it was at her suggestion that, that we um, hold this meeting with you all. And I think it was partially based on um, that closure around Christmas time. So thanks Diane. Um, and feel free if you wanna jump in and introduce, introduce yourself to the whole group. Hi, I'm Diane. Thanks for calling me out, Russ. <laughs> so I am the I'm Capitol. Here. I am the Capitol Hill Construction Coordinator. Uh, uh, people refer to us as Hub Coordinators. Um, I did. I have been working with the Melrose Promenade folks with Marilyn and Sarah here. I've just been really aware that you folks um, are going to have to endure some construction. And I've you know, been working with these folks for a few months now, wanting to be sure that you know, everybody was on the same page and understood what was going to happen. And for my part, I know that um, you know, the construction that comes around uh, the market can really affect your business without a doubt. And a portion of the work that I do is also in trying to expedite construction so that they stay out of SDOT's way, so that it makes it a little less crazy than it would be with the exception of Christmas week. Um, the, uh, I do know that there are, are some other projects right now that are coming up with a lot of telecom um, over on uh, minor at Pike, everybody, all of the telecom companies are trying to get in over there right now. Um, and so I'm trying to meet uh, out there work so that it's not affecting you folks, especially as the weather gets better and your streeteries get open. I, I know that you don't want um, to hear beeping alarms while the diners are sitting there trying to enjoy their delicious food and drinks. So I definitely got you all in mind and, um, and trying to make sure that the contractors understand about 10 day notification and really have your addresses and things like that. Please don't ever be afraid to reach out to me. That's great. Thank you, Diane. Thank I, I'm sorry, I have to jump off as well, but I wanna thank Sarah and Marilyn and Diane all for this conversation. This is the way that we hope to progress in the future to have these early conversations. It sets us all up for success um, down the line. So thank everyone for participating. I did wanna just uh, point your attention to AJ's note in the chat. AJ Kari had to leave, but AJ is our uh, construction slash small business coordinator through the Office of Economic Development. And he is also the person that's working with the SBA loans and PPE. So if any of you need other forms of support during this time outside of construction, AJ is your contact. Um, and AJ and Diane are always available to talk. But I have to run. But thank you so much, all of the SDOT staff and all of the Melrose folks. I really appreciate it. Um, hopefully it's going to set us all up for a successful transition and we'll be as I can't, I'll never use the word painless because that would be silly, but well, less pain. So thank you very much. I appreciate it. I have to Thanks, go. Michael. Thanks, Michael. Sarah, will you, will you send the name and email for uh, everybody who was on this call so that uh, if we need to reach out to AJ or something like that? I mean, the, 
the problem with the chat on Zoom is that when you finish the call, that goes away. So we can. Right. Yeah. <laughs> we will was, have this recorded. Oh, and Jasmine, go ahead. Yeah, I was actually just, I just dropped in the chat. I pulled AJ's contact information to the notes that I've been taking for today. So if there's any relevant contact information, it will be included in the notes that we send out afterwards. Super. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, so our next steps is we um, are going to be incorporating this feedback as uh, we figure out what we put into the construction contractor requirements. Um, this will be going to add um, for the contractor this spring. And then um, we're waiting on the federal grant, which is funding a good portion of this project before we can have a final schedule, but we're hoping that we can start construction around this June. And then like Marilyn said, it will would probably go until early next year. Marilyn, you wanna jump in on that? That's perfect, you hit everything. <laughs> All right. <laughs> and so in the meantime, we're happy to answer any questions, um, email or phone, or we can always do more meetings like this. Um, and we'll have points of contact um, during construction too. Um, I will paste just the project web page within the chat because that has our um, project inbox and phone number that, that you can always reach and we can connect you to other people. Um, besides that, if, if you're on this call, we're gonna automatically <laughs> add you to our um, listserv um, email list, but feel free to let us know if you don't wanna be added and um, that way you can get updates through emails. And you're planning on sending like what weekly construction updates while we're actively During in construction? construction? We generally do weekly construction updates, yeah. Okay. I think, Sarah, uh, this is great. And I really appreciate all the work that you're putting into this. Um, I think that also uh, regular update to the uh, updates to the schedule would be great. Mm -hmm. If there is any delay in getting the federal grant or anything like that, I think that the all the business owners on the street would like to know so uh, in advance so that they can prepare uh, or know if there are delays, basically. There's already been delay, <laughs> which is why we're doing this so late. I mean, you'll recall we talked a while, quite a while ago about this project. So yeah, it's been uh, quite a slog with that grant. So we just recirculated the uh, grant obligation package for signatures and it's gone over to WashDOT. So this really should be the last time. <laughs> Mm -hmm. But yeah, we will keep you updated on that. Great. Okay. Just say that on behalf of most of the business owners around here that I've been talking to, like, we're all very excited about this project. Um, we want it to happen. It's been talked about for so long and we just kind of want to get it done. So we are ready and willing to like sacrifice a little bit, be patient. And I think the biggest thing is the communication. It, it does seem like we are the last to know a lot of times. And then that is when I just lose my lose my cool and so i think if we can get out in front of it and communicate um if we have the opportunity to educate our customers about what's happening i think it's going to be huge um and get them excited about it too i think is the like second part of that so anything that if you guys have outlets like maybe oed can help us with some some advertising or signage or something like that um that we can we can post around the shop and around the neighborhood and even on our websites and email, email lists and stuff like that would be helpful. Uh, so yeah, thank you for everybody's time and let's get it done. Okay. Absolutely, and if I could say, sorry, hang okay. on to Sarah's and Jasmine's contact information um, and because they'll be handling the, you know, the main points of contact during construction. And um, if you know of anybody else that like wasn't involved in this call that, you know, really probably should be in the loop, feel free to let them know to uh, sign up for the email updates. We would love, we'll, we'll add as many people as necessary to that. Um, agreed. And if you want to connect separately um, with your idea on the signage and such, um, we can do that. Okay, great. Any other last things before we sign off? Thank you for staying longer than an hour. Well, thank you so much, sir. This was great. And the whole uh, SDOT team, thanks for all the hard work. Hopefully we can get it done and uh, it'd be great. It'll look so good after, after we're done. Agreed, agreed. Yeah, hopefully we'll all be masks off and- <laughs> Yeah, I hope so. When this is all over, it'll be a new beginning. <laughs>
Great. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Bye.